Over the years, the U.S. Navy has flown all sorts of planes off of its aircraft carriers, but the biggest has to be a C-130 Hercules. And if you think that sounds impossible, you should know they successfully did it dozens of times. Before we can really appreciate how they pulled this off, first, let's talk about why. See, America's Nimitz and Ford-class supercarriers make up the backbone of what could be described as the U.S. Navy's Blue Water Force. When you hear the term Green Water Navy, we're talking about a force that's largely relegated to littoral or coastal operations because of their reliance on frequent resupplies from friendly ports nearby. A Blue Water Navy, on the other hand, has the ability to operate globally, leveraging a combination of friendly ports and at-sea replenishment to keep each warship adequately fueled and supplied for the fight. These supply shipments often come during port stops or from other ships while at sea, but those aren't always readily available options. For carriers that are forward deployed in combat operations, getting a heavy payload of essential parts or supplies to the ship quickly could mean the difference between making mission or mission failure. For smaller jobs, carrier onboard delivery aircraft could make the deliveries, but by the early 1960s, it was becoming clear that the planes relied on for this role, like the Grumman C-1 Trader, just weren't able to deliver some of the heavier parts or equipment that a carrier might really need in the middle of a fight. Today, America's modern Nimitz and Ford-class supercarriers don't need to refuel for literally decades at a time, but they still need all sorts of supplies from land-based installations, ranging from common types of stuff that you need to support more than 3,000 troops on board to replacement parts for the aircraft that operate from the carrier's flight deck. So the Navy set out to find a way to get larger shipments out to carriers at sea without having to devise an expensive clean-sheet aircraft for the job. After a fair bit of consideration and debate, a solution that was just crazy enough to work eventually surfaced, and that was landing Lockheed's four-engine C-130 Hercules right on the deck of America's aircraft carriers. Now, if you're not familiar with carrier operations, what you really need to know is that aircraft usually need to be purpose-built for the job. Lockheed Martin's F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is thought of as just one jet, but it's actually three different aircraft. The F-35A and B are intended to fly from conventional airstrips or short and austere runways, respectively. But the F-35C is the only variant that's actually rated for carrier operations. In order to understand why, you have to consider the incredible forces that carrier aircraft are subjected to during takeoffs and landings. Today's carrier-based fighters utilize steam or electromagnetic-powered catapults to propel them to take off speeds in a fraction of the time normal aircraft use to climb into the sky. When landing, Carrier-based aircraft deploy hooks to grab massive steel cables that arrest their forward movement almost instantly, despite the fact that pilots go full throttle immediately upon touching the deck, just in case anything goes wrong. To put this in terms that we can all appreciate, imagine taking your regular car and replacing its brakes with a steel hook. You accelerate up to 140 miles per hour and keep your foot firmly planted on the gas, as you lower the hook and have it catch a steel cable that will immediately arrest your forward momentum. As you can imagine, that's gonna break some stuff on your car. Now imagine if it was the only way you could ever stop. Such is the engineering challenge of creating an aircraft that can reliably fly off of a carrier's flight deck. So as you can imagine, carrier-based fighters tend to be heavier because of the reinforced fuselages and other things like their added tail hooks but they're still expected to offer a similar lifespan and reliability to their land-based counterparts. In a perfect world, Lockheed would have taken the Navy's idea to land a Hercules on their carriers and devised an all-new C-130 purpose-built for the rigors of carrier life. But it's not a perfect world, and funding was minimal, so the Navy opted instead to experiment with the concept using nothing more than a lightly modified Marine Corps KC-130F, now, what this aircraft lacked in a carrier-specific design, it more than made up for in things like stability, payload capacity, and range, all of which were just too good for the Navy to ignore. The only changes they made to this mighty KC-130 were the installation of a smaller nose landing gear, an improved braking system that was intended to prevent skidding on the flight deck, and they removed the aircraft's underwing fuel pods. Beyond that, 
The first attempt at landing a C-130 aboard an aircraft carrier would come from an otherwise off-the-shelf KC-130 that was really never intended for such a feat. Way back in 1963, then-Lieutenant James H. Flatley III was chosen for the historic first attempt at landing a C-130 on an aircraft carrier. And as may come as little surprise, he reportedly thought the Navy was joking when they gave him his orders. Flatley was a fighter pilot who had never even flown a four-prop aircraft before. Those seemingly hilarious orders, however, had actually come directly from the Chief of Naval Operations himself, and they were precisely as serious as the mission was dangerous. No one had ever attempted to land an aircraft as big as a C-130 on any of the Navy's flat tops before. And while success could potentially mean a meaningful shift in how carrier resupplies were executed, failure just might mean death for Flatley and his crew. On October 3rd, 1963, the fateful day had arrived. And almost as though fate wanted to make sure this wouldn't be too easy on anyone, he was headed for the USS Forrestal, which was positioned some 500 miles off America's Atlantic coast near Boston. The waters that day were choppy, which affected the pitch of the deck, and flatly faced 40 knot winds as he approached the aircraft carrier. According to Lockheed's chief engineer at the time, Art E. Flock, who was on board for the test, from the captain's bridge where he was standing, he watched the bow pitch up and down at least 30 feet as the aircraft approached. Now, as a Navy fighter pilot, Flatley had done this approach countless times before, but the F-4 Phantom he knew so well had a wingspan of only around 38 feet. Now he was headed straight for the Forrestal's flight deck in a four-prop C-130 with a wingspan that was nearly four times bigger. As the ship's flight deck pitched and rolled in the Atlantic waves, Flatley brought his massive C-130 down onto the carrier with expert precision, missing the Forrestal's control tower with the edge of the plane's wing by just about 15 feet. He landed to a round of applause that ultimately gave way to a bit of laughter, as people began to notice the message painted on the side of the fuselage. It said, Look, Ma, no hook. It was a huge success, but this was far from the last time Flatley would fly the C-130 onto or off of an aircraft carrier. For the remainder of that month, he and his crew would execute a variety of flight operations from the Forrestal, including 21 full-stop landings without any need for arresting gear, and 21 more unassisted takeoffs from the same flight deck. On top of those flights, they also successfully executed 29 stop-and-go landings on the carrier, seemingly proving that, despite not being designed for the job, Lockheed C-130 was entirely capable of carrier duty. In order to